بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره In the first session we talked about the significance of dua and we said dua is the core of ibadah, the core of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dua is the weapon of mu'min. Dua is the powerful instrument by which you can change your destiny, destiny of your family, your community. And dua is something that is never late. As long as you have opportunity for dua, you must use it. Never say it is too late. It's already decided. It's already over. Always you should do dua. And then we said that we should think and reflect on the notion of dua and the concept of dua and this is what we are going to do inshallah today and inshallah if time permits we move on to dua as a healer inshallah there are different uh, books written on dua some Ulama in their book on Akhlaq have discussed Dua and also great Mufassirin of the Quran have discussed the topic of Dua in their books on uh, exegesis of the Quran. So we have rich literature about Dua in addition to the rich literature of Duas that we have from Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam we have many books written on Dua but Islam is so deep and so comprehensive that there is always chance for new research and for finding new ideas one area which is very important and I think still needs to be really a scholarly pursuit is dua normally it is said that dua has two types sometimes dua is a request you ask for something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there are people who may ask for something from other sources for example, the idol worshippers, when they had a problem, they used to go to their idols. And still, maybe there are still some idol worshippers. So if, for example, they want a child, if they want rain, if they want to have good harvest, they used to go to their idols. There is a modern form of idol worshipping, and that is when we go to our you know, for example, uh, worldly sources for asking for help. For example, I think that my degree or my experience or my, I don't know, society of, uh, for example, colleagues or some, for example, organizations, they are the people who can help me and solve my problem and somehow be much so much depend on them as if you are worshipping them. But Mu'mineen, of course, they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what they want. Even if they ask someone else for help, 
deep in their mind and heart they know that they are not asking that person independently so if for example i am in need of help with respect to my for example health i go to a doctor i ask for help but deep in my mind i know that this doctor is not the one who is giving me shifa even if i ask him for help i know that he is just an agent an instrument if i for example ask someone for some financial help if i ask someone for example to marry me if i ask someone for example i don't know to find me a job everything that i ask people as a mu'min i know that they have no full control no authority no power they can just be at the end in the best scenario someone through whom allah blesses me therefore a mu'min never asks someone independent from allah and then a mu'min always prefers not to mention his or her request to someone that is not close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, then we have this concept of tawassul, that when we have some requests, we go to the pious people, either by actually visiting them, or if they are not available, by remembering them, by doing ziyara of them, we approach them with our request not because they are able to give it independent from allah but because they have close position with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we ask them for help this is not shirk absolutely and this is indeed a humble way of asking allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because i am saying to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala i am not worthy of asking you directly I am asking you through the people that are close to you. It's not shirk, it's pure tawheed. It's very beautiful way of expressing your appreciation of greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a mu'min always is clear that he is not asking anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are many verses of the Quran about this matter. If we get chance, we will talk about them. I want to mention two beautiful du'as, one from Imam Zain al-Abidin, one is from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, as as examples of how to communicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in particular I have chosen these two passages because these two relate to the whole issue of talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yesterday, I emphasized on this point that it's very important for us to have communication with Allah, to have this line open with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is our honor. This is our success. Indeed, if we realize this is our achievement, if someone's achievement in his life is that he's always in communication with Allah, this is great achievement. You don't need anything else. A real believer, a real Arif doesn't need to ask anything from Allah. If he has this connection with Allah, he doesn't need anything else. So I have chosen these two passages because they reflect on the concept of dua and communication to Allah. I start with this passage from Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam. It's a not a whole dua, it's a selection of dua. Oh Allah, oh my Lord, by which tongue I can call you, I can pray, I can speak to you. While I know that my sins have made me unable to talk. I am not able to speak because I have committed sins. So either I feel embarrassed to talk or because my spiritual tongue is now really not working. Maybe I can speak to people. But when I want to speak the truth, when I want to speak good things, I cannot. You know, sometimes you can speak hours 
by physical tongue, but your spiritual tongue is dead. So any of these two meanings, Imam says, how can I call you? How can I speak to you? How can I call you? How can I pray to you? How can I speak to you while I am disobedient? I'm a bad person. I'm a sinful person. You know, if you have wronged someone, especially someone to whom you owe a lot, then it's very difficult to go and speak to him. Even sometimes you feel shy to go and ask for apologies. You say, I cannot see that person. Even asking for apologies is difficult. But on the other hand, but how can I not call you while I know you are very kind, very nice with people, very much loving your servants? So here we have a challenge. When we look at our own performance, our own heart, we feel unable to talk but when we remember Allah's greatness Allah's mercifulness we get the courage to speak Imam says how can I be ever happy while I am a sinful person a killer a murderer, a mischief maker, a criminal, that police is after him, everyone is after him, he's wanted. How can he have joy? How can he have, you know, happy life? He's always worried because he has a bad record. So how can I ever be happy while I am a sinful person? But on the other hand, when I have such a Lord like you, how can I be always sad? When I know how kind you are, how forgiving you are, then it gives me some chance to be a little bit happy. How can I call you while I am what I am? This is very brief sentence but full of meaning I cannot say how many problems I have I cannot say how many bad things I have done so it's enough to say to Allah how can I call you while I am what I am even I don't want to open this file I don't want to mention the list of all the bad things that I have done Allah knows better I am what I am but when it comes to you, you have so many beautiful qualities that I cannot do justice. So it's better to say you are what you are. But when it comes to my problems, my crime, my need, it's better just to say I am what I am. So how can a person like me dare to call you but at the same time, how can a person like me stop calling someone like you? And then later Imam says, وَأَنَا أَسْتَحْيِي أَنْ أَدْعُوَكَ I really feel embarrassed to call you. So Imam Zain al Abidin says this. And Imams, when they pray to Allah, when they invocated, when they did all these munajat, they were really meaning this. It was not a show, na'uzu billah, that they just did this so that we learn. They really felt the moment of the prayer and they cried. But Imam says, Ana astahyi an I feel embarrassed to call you. Wa ana musarron ala while I am insisting on my sins. وَكَيْفَ بَعَبْدٍ لَا يَدْعُوا سَيِّدَهُ 
But on the other hand, what is going to happen to a servant who is not calling his Lord, who is not in communication with his Lord? Where can he go? What can he do? Who is going to provide him with refuge? What is going to happen to a person who has no Lord, who has no one to look after him? A child who is in need of his parents from every aspect. Food, love, support, dress, protecting him from bad people. How can this child of two years old survive without his parents? When it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our situation is not like even a two-year-old child. We cannot even stand on feet without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At least a child can stand on his feet. We cannot do anything apart from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Aynamma farruhu. Where can he go? Where can he run away? Where can he get refuge? There is no way, absolutely no way other than going to Allah himself. The second passage I have chosen is from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Ilahi kayfa ad'uka wa qad asaytuka. Oh Allah, how can I call you why I have disobeyed you? But wa kayfa la ad'uka wa qad araftu hubbaka fi qalbi. But how can I stop calling you while I have found your love exists in my heart? I love you. How can I stop calling someone that I love? وَإِن كُنْتُ عَاصِيًا If I am a sinful person, مَدَدْتُ إِلَيْكَ يَدًا بِالظُّنُوبِ مَمْلُوءَ I extend my hand, I stretch my hand towards you while my hand is full of sins. But still I want to stretch my hand to you. I don't want to open it to anyone else. وَعَيْنَايَ بِالرَّجَاءِ مَمْدُودًا And I want to stare at you with the eyes which are full of hope. So although my hands are full of sins, but my eyes are full of hope. Mawlaya and ta'zimul ulama. You are the greatest of the great. Wa ana asirul usara. I am the person who is very much kept not active, not able to move, not to do anything. I am like a captive in the hand of enemies because of what I have done to myself. Imagine a person who takes refuge from his enemies. If you know all of a sudden in a battle you are confused. Instead of going towards your friends and your own army, you go towards the enemies and ask for help. And enemies come and surround you. What can you do then? You have put yourself in the hands of enemies. They were trying hard to find you. You with your own feet went towards them. Ana asirul usara. Ana asirun bidhambi. Because of my sins I have become captive of shaitan. Shaitan was trying hard to catch me. But was not able. Allah has not given ability to shaitan to catch any person. But you yourself ran away towards shaitan. Put yourself in the hands of shaitan. In a very humble way. Not in a way that you know sometimes people who are very much demanding you know argue that you must give me you know, sometimes some children do this with the parents. Sometimes some adults do this with their, I don't know, boss. You know, asking with arrogance. No, in a very humble way. In a way that Allah loves. In a way which is full of praising Allah. We say to Allah, Oh Allah, if you ask me about my crimes, you are going to question me about the crimes. I am going to ask you to give me because of your karam, because of your generosity. This is a very humble way. It means that you have everything to question me. 
But on the other hand, I have good qualities of you which can help me. This is very nice. This is appreciation. This is gratefulness. This is not arrogance. If you keep asking me about my crimes, I ask you for your forgiveness. I know that you are afuv, you are kafur, you are the most forgiving person. So this is the time to show your forgiveness. And then Imam says, وَلَئِنْ أَمَرْتَ بِي إِلَى النَّارِ If you ask the angels to take me to hell. This is the time that you have to remember all the time, you know, you have to remember, inshallah, this doesn't happen. But, you know, you cannot dismiss the possibility. Imam Sadiq is thinking about that possibility. Everyone has to think about that possibility. You have to prepare yourself. It's not something that happens to other people. Everyone must be ready for such possibility. You have to equip yourself. You have to take all the provision and all the equipments that can help you to be saved. So when people are judged, some people are taken to heaven, some people are taken to hell. If it happens that I am taken to hell. What arguments I have to say? What can I say to Allah? Can I say your judgment was wrong? Can I say you were not fair and just with me? Can I say I have done something that you forgot? Can I say you have not treated me with favor? And this is why I have become bad. What excuse I have to say? Can I blame other people? Say so I am not responsible. All the responsibility lies on others. I have nothing to say. So, Imam says, "Lain amarta bi ilanar." If you ask to take me to hell, I am not going to argue anything. But I will do something that then, inshallah. Knowing that I am going to do this, you are not going to let me to go to hell. If you ask them to take me to hell, then I will tell all the people who are there in hell, I will Then I am going to tell them that I am a believer. I am a person who believes in God, who believes in Islam. Either it means that then I am going to tell them that you have put a believer in hell. So that I am sure you are not going to let this happen. Or it means that. Even if you put me there, I have such a loyalty to you that I don't change my mind. I don't say now that it's not working, it's, the, it's not useful, why I should be a believer. Even if you put me in hell with all honor, I say I believe in you. Or as Imam Ali said in Du'ai Kumil, I would say, I love you. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows that there is such a loyalty in a person that he loves him, he believes in him, even if he is put in hell, so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him. Of course, this is something that is not easy to claim. It's very, very difficult. How many of us if we are put into hell by Allah, still we would say we love him. In dunya, you know, sometimes we are put in conditions like hell, which is much easier than hell. But, you know, we think that our life is hell. I have no, for example, good family relation or I don't have a job. I don't have, I don't know, health. Lots of problems. 
Sometimes you see shaitan comes and gradually wants to make us stop loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah is a kind, why he's ignoring you? If Allah is kind, why he doesn't listen to you? Why he doesn't accept your prayer? Why you who are such a nice person has all the problem? Those people who have no iman, they enjoy their life. Shaitan comes with different arguments to take away your love for Allah. How many of people can survive? How many people can preserve their love for Allah? It's very difficult. So now imagine if a person is put, of course because of his own bad actions, is put in hell. If he really can still say, I love you, I don't think fire can touch this person. I'm sure this person would be released from hell. Because he is not a person who is not honest. He is not saying this just verbally. After such a great test. If you really love someone and that person doesn't pay attention to you. You keep showing love. That person doesn't pay attention. Even he starts doing bad things to you. Even he says bad things. About, and you still love him. Then this is a real love. But if he says he's kind to you, you love him. If tomorrow he is not kind, so you say, I hate you, then this is not love. Love is not su easily switched on and off. Love takes time to be switched on, when, and it is on, it never stops. Do you think that easily, you know, today they love each other, tomorrow they hate each other? This is not love. So, Imam says, pleased but sin doesn't harm you. This is a very beautiful point. If you do something good, Allah becomes pleased, happy. But if you do something wrong, you cannot harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our good actions do not benefit him, but please him. Our bad actions do not harm him, just displease him. So, Imam says to Allah, Oh Allah, I know that ta'a makes you happy. My bad actions do, do not harm you. So, fahabli ma yasurruka. So, please enable me to do something that makes you happy with me. Waqfirli ma la yadurruka. And if I have done anything bad, please forgive what cannot harm you. So, you are not harmed. I am such an insignificant, you know, person. I am less than even a mosquito, less than a fly, compared to your greatness. If you imagine, you know, sometimes a fly can annoy you. Sometimes a fly can even kill Namrud. But we are even less capable of a fly. We cannot do anything to even annoy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot do any harm to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Imam says, oh Allah, please forgive. The bad thing that I have done, but I have never harmed you. And please enable me to do things that make you happy. Ya Arham al Oh, the most, the most merciful of the merciful. So, you see, we have to always find ways to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you feel happy, speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you feel sad, make this sadness an excuse to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to get rid of my sadness. Let me talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If, if you feel lonely, speak to Allah. If you are with many people around you, speak to Allah. Never stop speaking to Allah. If you are hopeful, speak to Allah. If you are fearful, Speak to Allah. Never stop talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A mu'min always finds an excuse to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to prolong his speech with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
it is mentioned in many books on balagh and rhetorics that sometimes when you enjoy your conversation with someone you prolong your conversation and a very famous example is the example of Prophet Musa Allah Nabi Nawa Ali Wa Salam. Prophet Musa when he was asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Ma tilka bi ya Musa What is in your right hand Musa? Perhaps that was the beginning of conversation with Allah for Musa one of the very first sentences I mean beginning that incident was the beginning so Allah said what is in your right hand Musa alayhi salam said hiya asai that is my stick first of all why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ask him what is in your hand Allah knows what is of Musa but Allah wants to talk to Musa and wants him to reply so Allah said what is in your right hand he said this is my stick but then he was so much loving to talk to Allah he continued ya asai atawakkaw alayha wa ahushu biha ala ghanami this is my stick sometimes I rely on it and for example when i'm tired you know i uh, lean on that as a stick sometimes i have my sheep my goat with this i drop leaves from the trees so that they can eat there are also other ways that i benefit from this stick so musa didn't just say this is my stick he used other reasons to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so a mu'min always tries to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because this is the best opportunity to keep the line on between you Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so dua is sometimes to ask something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dua is sometimes not necessarily to ask anything just to call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thirdly dua is sometimes just to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even there are certain du'as that you don't talk to Allah directly. You don't address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of the du'as we talk about Allah as a third party. But still it is du'a. Why? Because you are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, there is a du'a which is attributed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it, it is known as Hadith Arafah Akthar du'a'i wa du'a'i al-anbiya qabli bi'arafat The du'a which I frequently use in Arafat and the prophets before me used in Arafat is this dua. Look at this dua. La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah lahul mulku wa lahul hamd wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. Very short, very deep. La ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. Everything comes from Tawheed. Everything is based on Tawheed. Everything is evolving around Tawheed. Lahul mulku wa lahul hamd wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. Do you see any request here? There is no request. Do you see even, even an address? 
There is no anta. There is no laka. It's third party. Wahdahu la sharika lahu. But still, this is dua and not dua of one prophet, dua of prophets. Because dua is to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remembrance can come with request. Remembrance can come without request by talking to Allah. Remembrance can come even when you don't talk to Allah, but you remember Him in your heart or mention on your tongue this is remembrance this is dua this is calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you know Allah is present sometimes I speak to you sometimes I read something that I have written about you you are here when you are listening to me you are hearing to me it doesn't make difference I can speak you as addressee I can speak about you as third party in, dua, in uh, uh, Surah Hamd, we have beautiful combination of both. When we start Surah Hamd, we start with third party pronoun. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Up to here, we don't address him. But we are saying this in his presence. Then we say, So there is a shift. As ulama said, there is iltifat. There is turning from third party to second party. Why? Because when you start talking about Allah and praising him, then you reach the point that you cannot stop talking to him you so much fall in love with him that now you want to talk to him so you start with alhamdulillah rabbil alameen but then you say iyyaka na'bud wa iyyaka nasta'in similar to this is in dua nudba in dua nudba when we reach imam mahdi ajalallah ta'ala farajahu sharif In some part, we talk about him. In some part, we talk to him. For example, in some part, we say, Aina mu'izzul awliya wa mudhillul a'da. Where is he? But then, we reach the point that we talk to him. Layta shi'ri aina staqarrat bikannawa. So, it doesn't make difference whether you are addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or you are remembering him without talking to him. This is dua. Indeed, it can even be said that a mu'min, when he is also silent, it's possible to be in the condition of dua. Why? Maybe he's not saying anything, but in his heart he cannot forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In his heart he's thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you really love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you cannot stop thinking about him. Whether you talk about it or not. In your heart, think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, dua is very close to zikr. Dua is very similar to remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, most of the time it comes with request. But it is not necessary to come with request. It can be just talking to Allah or even just thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you would not be surprised that why in Islam so much emphasis has been put on dua and at the same time on zikr. There is no contradiction. Zikr and dua are connected. Dua is a kind of zikr. If it is not similar to the zikr exactly.
At, at least you can say it's very close to zikr. In my understanding, dua is zikr. So, dua is for us the most powerful way to gain closeness to Allah, to gain light, to gain assistance for our struggle. I wanted to mention also a verse from the Quran and I think this would be my last point and inshallah about dua being healer we will talk about it tomorrow. Another verse about the Quran and this would be the last point today is the verse 186 of Surah Baqarah. Very well known verse and very beautiful no matter how much you know about this it's always beautiful a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim wa idha sa'alaka ibadi anni when my servants my people ask you about me this is prophet being told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when my people come to you and ask about me. This is one of the beauties of faith, of religion, especially Abrahamic religions, that they help you to establish a very close and intimate relation with God. Through philosophy, you cannot establish such intimate relation with God. Maximum is say that there is a first cause. There is uncaused cause. First mover. They speak as it is something very, you know, abstract. Something very far. Even in some religions, some Eastern religions, either they don't talk about God, about God like Buddhism. Or when it comes to Hinduism, the way they talk about God is very different. Sometimes God is mixed with everything. But in Abrahamic religions, we at the same time that keep transcendence of God, we don't make God physical, we don't make God you know, like a human being. But you can always speak to God. You can have one by one relation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says to the Prophet, if my people ask you about me, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Truly I am near. Even Allah doesn't say, tell them I am near. He is so near that He says, if they ask you, I am near. So there is no need you tell them. I am giving them the answer. Like someone, you know, who speaks to you, he says, you know, I have a message for Sheikh Shumali. Then I say, I am here. You don't need to pass on the message to him. Allah says, if they ask you about me, I am near. I reply to the call of everyone who calls me. So dua is not necessarily coming with requests, calling me. Everyone who calls me, I answer. This is the best thing. Then on side of that, you can ask for other things. But the best thing is to draw the attention of Allah to yourself. Imagine you go to, for example, a very big gathering. 10,000 people are there. And they are all waiting for a very great, you know, personality to come. Then you are one person out of one, you know, for example, 10,000 people. You shake hand and that person smiles at you and shows that he knows you. You are so happy that out of 10,000, that king or president just showed me, you know, his hand and, you know, showed that he knows me. You will be very happy. I received attention. What is greater than receiving attention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He has billions of people just among 
us on the earth. I don't know how many angels he has. You can always draw his attention to you. With love, with care, not just he is, you know, sign something for you. He loves you, he cares you. So, أُجِيبُ دَعْبَةَ الدَّعْءِ إِذَا دَعَانِ If he calls me. This is important. If there is any condition for dua, this is the only condition that you should call him. Don't call anyone else. Don't stop your call half the way. Call him. So it means that first you have to, like for example, if I want to call someone, I should dial right, right number. If I dial wrong number, then I shouldn't expect call to be replied, to be answered. And also, if I, for example, dial right number, then I am not patient. Before the call is made and the connection is made, I stop. So I shouldn't blame that person why you didn't reply. He said, you didn't wait for me. I wanted to pick up the phone, but you had already stopped. This is important, inshallah, later when we talk about why some du'as are not answered, we will talk about this. If they call me, I will reply. So they should also respond to me. They should also pay attention to me. And believe in me. Why? Do I need them? No. لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ So that they themselves benefit, find their way towards their happiness. Rushed is opposite to غَي. غَي means to be misguided. Rushed is to be guided. To be able to secure your interests. If I call you to give you, to help you, you should answer so that you will be guided. I don't want to do anything for me. I just want to help you. If you ask a teacher, an alim, a wise person, a hakim to help you, and he comes to you, then you say, thank you very much for coming, Khuda Hafiz. So what was the point? If he gives you a prescription, if he gives you some instruction, you have to act upon it. Otherwise you say, Alhamdulillah, the doctor visited me, the teacher visited me, the Hakim visited me, but I'm not listening to him. So this is not helping to reach rushed guidance. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Keep us always in the state of remembrance of Him. May Allah keep all our hearts, inshallah, always enlightened with His love and Iman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all our sins and mistakes. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us, our families, our children, our community from anything which is bad and disliked. May Allah bring in this month of Ramadan prosperity, happiness, joy, security, to all people of the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasten the reappearance of Imam Zaman and make it as soon as possible and as easy as possible. May Allah send his rahmah to all the marhumin, marhumin of the brothers and sisters here, those who have rights upon us, our teachers, our ulama, our marajah, our parents, for parents. May Allah inshallah please them with us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let them be with Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. May Allah give shifa to all the people who are ill, especially those who have no hope for any solution. Doctors have said there is no way for you to be treated. May Allah himself give them shifa right away, inshallah. Wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillah rabbil alam.